Hi, everybody. It is a, a privilege for me to be here uh, with Sheila Baer, uh, the former chair of the FDIC. Uh, we used to spend a lot of time together we did, didn't we? Uh, talking about uh, the financial crisis and what was going on uh, before and after 2008. Uh, but uh, President Bear now uh, has been the president of Washington College for the past two years and uh, has been talking a lot about a potential other crisis uh, that is going on in the world of education, uh, which uh, has to do, of course, with the cost of education, the cost of student debt, and you've been very vocal on those issues and we want to talk about them. Um, but I want to start the conversation here, which is to say you have gone from government running the FDIC right. to now running a, a, a a college. Right. You have seen the books of our own, uh, of Washington, and now you've seen the books of schools. <laughs> um, what have you made of the last two years in terms of looking at the cost the and cost, the math yeah. of yeah. all of this? Yeah. Well, I, I think there are a lot of things going on. And uh, I think at first it's important to understand that when you hear about these high sticker prices of tuition, that that's that the sticker price generally is not the, the price that a student pays. Scholarships are, are typically uh, freely provided by my college and others. But nonetheless, it's still really expensive. And so why is that? Well, I think uh, part of it, it was just uh, too easy to raise tuition for a while. You know, the demographics, the high school populations were increasing for a while. And then when the federal government uh, went to direct lending, uh, it really uh, opened up the spigot. So it was easy for students to borrow to pay for those tuition increases. I don't, I think that did, it has part of the problem, I like this whole problem. I do think that, um, again, the high sticker prices you hear about, there's a lot of what I call cross subsidization going on. So we have a shrink, some of this is demographic, we have a shrinking middle class. So you're seeing a lot of very high financial needs students and then you've got a, a, a group of wealthier families, but that's, that's a shrinking uh, pie and, and a shrinking middle class. So, you know, to charge a high sticker price that the wealthier families will use, will pay, so you can provide more scholarships and things for the low income students, I think that has also kind of driven these, these very high numbers that you hear about. But I also think it's, you know, it's a cultural mindset. Um, it just was too easy to raise tuition for too long. And uh, you need to start rethinking now your budget. And what I try to remind my folks at Washington College is uh, we have a program called George's Brigade, which is a full, full ride for very low income students. And we have to raise about $20,000 a year in donations to cover it in our budget. So every time they want to spend $20,000 on something, I say, is it worth a George's Brigade scholar? Because, you know, we're a tuition driven institution. This isn't money that just magically comes out, you know. It, we have to charge tuition for most of it, and then most of that, in turn, is, is paid for through borrowing. So what was the biggest surprise in the budget? When you went through your own oh, yeah. budget, when my own budget, and you yeah. looked at it and you said, I don't understand this. So I think another driver of cost, and there are a lot of studies on this, is, is the non-faculty staff, right? So we, ha we have great staff. I don't want to suggest that. but the, this And this is not atypical at colleges. but quite a lot of non-faculty staff, right? And that you can you can see where the staff growth has been. It has been more on the non-faculty side. This idea that tenured faculty, you know, well-paid tenured faculty are a great narrative. There has been a lot of uh, administrative staff uh, increases that I think, again, you need to be smarter about. Some of it has been driven by regulation, uh, some of, including complexity of, of our financial assistance uh, programs. So, but there again, uh, you know, the default position in the past, every time there's a little issue, well, let's hire another staff person. You need to rethink that. You need to set up some cultural shifts so that people really think harder before they hire more staff. Uh, you have compared in our paper, in an op-ed in our paper, the student debt crisis uh, to the other crisis which we both right, lived yeah. through that I chronicled <laughs> and you lived. Right. How comparable is it really? And is there a tipping point at which you look at the student debt crisis that we talk so much about? Right and you say to yourself, we could be living back in that sort of 2008-like moment. So um, I don't think we'll have a sudden crisis because this is on the government's balance sheet. It's not on banks. So with the mortgages, ultimately, the risk was with the, uh, with the banks. And so you had a lot of sudden losses. And that destabilized the system. Most of this is on taxpayers' dimes. So uh, it's, that's an important difference. So it could contribute to our fiscal problems, not really a, a sudden shock to the financial system. It's a crisis, though, for the individuals, the borrowers, and there are a lot of them who just can't afford their student loans. And uh, I do think that that's, uh, we just need to get fundamentally get away from debt. Uh, and we can talk about that later into more of an equity model in, in paying for uh, college. But the parallels in terms of, look, you do not do anyone any favors by giving them a loan they cannot pay back. And we should have learned that during the mortgage crisis. And now we're just doing it again by 
making a lot of loans to students that really have no realistic, uh, realistic chance of paying back. Okay, so you said you have some solutions and you've written about them. Right, if I can yeah. make you king or queen for the day, right, right. you would do what? I would scrap debt. I wouldn't. You would scrap debt? I would scrap debt as There'd a way no to finance higher education. I would not use loans anymore. I would not. You want to think radical and big? This is what I would do. And I would do it for, for current borrowers as well. Look, it's, 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 I, I joke that you know, the government is a direct lender now, so the government is making most of these loans. And I joke that if they were a bank, we'd probably put them in jail because you know, kind of the, the core uh, principle of, of, of uh, responsible consumer lending is making a loan to someone you know they, can, they have a realistic chance of paying that back. There's no way you're going to know a 17 or 18 year old just starting college what they're going to major in, whether they're going to graduate, what kind of job they're going to get, what kind of job market they're going to be entering to. You just don't know what the repayment capacity is going to be. So if we want to make financing of higher education freely available, and I support that, I want everybody in this country to be, have access to where, you know, higher education. I want choice there. It's a vocational school, community college, liberal arts, whatever. But don't use debt, because there's no way you will know whether they can pay it back. So I like what's called income share. Uh, Purdue has pioneered it. They do something very similar um, in Australia where instead of debt, basically the student has a contract with the government and you will finance their higher education up to some point and then in return they will pay some percentage of their income over a period of years up to a certain cap. They'll, that's what they'll pay back and that may be more than what was originally financed, it might be less. And here again there's some cross subsidization because the, the kids that go out and work for hedge funds or tech companies or whatever make a couple hundred grand right off the bat. They're going to pay back more and they're going to pay it back faster than the kid that goes and teaches you know, high school in, in the inner city. But those are good professions that we want to support. And, uh, but everybody, the important point is everybody's got an affordable payment. And it's great in, when you get into, from a macroeconomic perspective, it's great because you get into a recession the payment automatically adjusts. So it's, it's tied to taxable income, adjusted gross, in, adjusted gross income. So instead of like when you have debt, as we saw during the mortgage crisis, debt's inflexible, you gotta pay it back, you can't pay it back, you know, you go into default, the bank takes a loss or whoever, you go into bankruptcy. Uh, with, with income share, there's just an automatic adjustment. You lose your job, you reduce your hours, your income goes down, your payment goes down. You recover, the, the economy recovers, your income goes back up, your payment goes back up. What are the market implications of doing that? Because you're right. Yeah. If you go off and shoot the moon, right. whether you're in technology or right. you become yeah. a hedge yeah. fund manager, right. Right. Uh, that's one thing. Right. If you uh, get a job uh, in education, and by the way, we want lots of people to have jobs Absolutely. in education. We and we'd do. love to, I'd love to figure out ways to right. subsidize that, but, yeah. but it does change the market forces. It does. But I think in a positive way, I think it promotes choice. You don't get into this, whether we have it free for public and community colleges is not for private. I mean, it, it promotes choice. I do think as a complement to income share, you need to have some college accountability. So there does need to be, you know, if, if, if a high percentage of a, of a college's uh, graduates are not paying back uh, over you know, some regional period of time, I think the college should have some skin in the game. I absolutely, because I think you do that, it reinforces the market discipline to make sure the college is fully invested graduating that student and making sure that they, uh, they have in, a job. In exactly. the short term, before the government takes us on to right. the degree they ever do, right. oh. is there a private market version mm -hmm. of this that there you is, could yeah. see work? Well, I think Purdue has done that, and we're looking at it at Washington College. And actually, when the college itself is providing the income share, it beautifully aligns incentives because the college will generate an income stream through their income share if they graduate their students, if their students get jobs and, and you know, produce income to, to uh, return, make payments on the income share. So uh, yeah, I think it's a good way. And you know, in talking with donors about this, uh, you know, if you wanna endow a scholarship, for instance, so most colleges use a 5% draw on their endowment. So you give me a million dollars for a scholarship, I can spend 50,000 a year on that. So, you know, 5%. If you give me a million dollars for income share, I can fully deploy that whole million dollars, and then it will, the pool will replenish over time as the income share agreements come back, income share payments get back. But it's a much better leveraging, I think, of donor dollars, and again, not really nicely aligns right. economic incentives. What do you make, if people have talked in the private markets uh, of student debt, if you will, about saying, look, if you're gonna major, uh, if, if you're gonna be an engineer, uh, we'll give you a very low interest rate right. because we think that this is going to work out for you. If you right. want to be a Russian literature major, uh, we may assign you a higher uh, interest rate because we're not so right. sure how quickly you're going to yeah. be able to yeah. make yeah. good on that. Yeah. A, does that make sense to you? And B, within the context of what you just described, right. would every university have every incentive 
to have every student go off and major as a, a major in engineering. I, I hope not. I don't think so. And I look, there are different models to use, and I think you need some experimentation with this. My preference would be to have the same rate for everybody. And I think, especially for a liberal arts college, look, hey, I was a philosophy major, so I didn't get a job when I graduated. I had to go to law school. But you know, over the years, uh, I think my philosophy major has better prepared me than any other training I had for the career that I have had. So I don't really want to pick and choose and say, if you're an engineer, we're going to give you a better deal than if you're a Russian literature major. I do, I believe in choice. I think students are the best uh, judge of what motivates them, what their passion is, and then to use that uh, to, to have some type of sustainable career later on. And uh, so no, I would not do it that way. I would have pretty much the same percentage uh, for everyone, but there are different models, and, and I get the point you're making, but my preference would be to have the same rate for everybody. Uh, you, you mentioned um, George's Brigade. You have another program which I love the name of. It's called Damn the Damn Debt. Damn the Debt, yeah. What is Damn the Debt? The Damn the Debt's great, the D-A-M. A little double entendre there. Uh, so it's donor funded, and it's basically we just pay down our graduating seniors' debt. So uh, What do you mean by that? So what we figured out, so, um, if you make a gift to someone uh, to pay down their debt, or if you're the employer pays down the student's uh, debt after they graduate, it's a taxable benefit. So you know that is mitigated some bit. But we figured out we can raise money and just give them an extra scholarship in their final semester. It's not taxable; it's a scholarship, and we can actually reduce their federal debt. But we'll hold it till the end. We call it a back-end scholarship because we want it to be a reward uh, for graduating, we, and we use it as a retention tool too. So yeah, we've we've reduced. We've made two payments last year and this year during my two years at Washington College. We've paid down about 10% of their federal education present and helps them have a little more fl financial flexibility when they enter the workforce. What do you think of the idea of free tuition across the board? You, yeah. you probably saw some of the headlines, uh, yeah. Cuomo's proposal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people say Harvard University, given the size of their endowment, could easily provide right. a free education for everybody. Yeah. Well, I think you need to distinguish whether taxpayers are doing it or, or private right. endowments are doing it. I think certainly, uh, I can't think of a better use of endowment money than scholarship support. And students should have some skin in the game, you know, whether it's they, they're required to work or whatever. You and I have talked about Berea College in Kentucky. Uh, that's a nice model where they, they provide free tuition, the student pays room for board, but they have to work too. So I think, I think those are good models. I think if the government's doing it, there again, uh, you know, government picking winners and losers. So we're going to do it for, you know, we're going to do it for community colleges. We're going to do it for public. We're not going to do it for private. It skews choice. And I do think that uh, whatever you use, the, the, the students should have a little skin in the game. I mean, if you make it completely free, you're probably going to be having a lot more students going to college without really thinking through whether college is the right choice for them. You know, I think you do want to slow them down a little bit. Or if, you know, if the, the, four, if the public university is right, is a community college right, is a vocational educational uh, environment right is a liberal arts college right. So I, I do think in terms of skewing market choice, I think I, I do worry as the president of a private college, if it's, we're just talking about public college being uh, free, I get why people might want to do that, but then I do, do think it skews choice away from private liberal arts schools, which, are, which I think are great. They're a unique part of the higher education system in the United States. Thus far, we've talked about the debt that students currently are taking on. Right. What do we do about all the debt that is outstanding? Yeah. Well, I, I put everybody into income share. I absolutely would. You mean would income just, share now? Yeah, I would just, if you've got a loan. Uh, Retroactively on, on, on a student who might no, have been I think in school a decade ago? I think anybody who still has outstanding debt. No, I wouldn't do that. No, you couldn't so do that. You have anybody who has outstanding debt, I would say let them put the, give them the option of putting that into an income share instead of a loan. What yeah, percentage do you think would take the deal? I don't know. You know, there would probably be some uh, good calculus about what's, you know, staying with their, their current plan or, or going to income share. Uh, but the nice thing about income share is you get downside protection. So even if you may right. be paying a little more than you would on a 10-year amortized loan, if you know if you get hit by a bus tomorrow and you're on disability all of a sudden, your your payments. I'm go thinking away. the problem is that a high earner mm -hmm. today wouldn't necessarily jump into the income program, given the, the, the low interest rate. They would. That's say. right. Well, you, prospectively, you need to put everybody into right. it, or you're going to have an adverse selection problem. But, but in terms of current students, I would still right. let the. I would give them the op option of income share. Look, you've seen the same studies I've right. had. This thing is a drag on the economy. I mean, young people tend to spend more of the disposable income. We have dramatically reduced the, the dollar amount of the disposable income because they have these these right. very large debt payments. Okay, so here's the real question. This is yep. all very theoretical and yep. fun to talk about. It is. However, to actually put it into practice is a different yep. thing. However, you also have spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C., so I you have. know about this. What's the chance the last 10 minutes of what we were talking about ever becomes real? <laughs> 
you know, the, the Trump budget, there, there are some issues with the Trump budget, but one thing, they're moving in that direction. So the Obama administration had something called income-driven repayment plans, which are a step in the right direction, but it's still debt, and there's some, there have been some problems with, with, with the complexity and, you know, what happens if you, uh, you know, you, your, your debt balance can actually, your principal balance can actually increase in certain of these plans. So the Trump administration wants to consolidate all this into one. Fairly simple, it's 12.5% um, that you pay for 15 years if you're an undergraduate, 30 years if you're a graduate. And your, your monthly payment is capped about what you would otherwise owe if it was a 10-year loan. So, so that, that goes in the right direction. It's still debt, though. Uh, so I, I would go full tilt. But I think, you know, this administration is sure your guess is as good as mine and whether what they can get done. But I, I think, I hope that's a piece of the budget that, that conservatives and liberals could, could really agree on. Because I think there's uniform consensus this is the way to go. Make it based, if you want an affordable payment, make it based on income and dramatically simplify the programs we have now. Okay, final question from me and then we're gonna go uh, to the audience. I know Adam is out there uh, somewhere. Um, it's really off the topic of education, but given that you predicted the financial crisis the right. first time around, <laughs> where are we now? <laughs> so that is off topic. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I, I worry that uh, these reforms took a long time, and got, got to speak to all my former uh, fellow regulators, and I was a, a part of the implementation process too, but it took kind of a long time. And I think there is, uh, there is uh, there are some legitimate concerns about the complexity of the rules and the simplification, and maybe they're, they're too burdensome on the smaller institutions, but I worry that, that the political dynamic has totally changed back to you know, deregulate, uh, you know, let's uh, get back to the good old days, and I do worry about that. You know, from my view, I've always thought the capital uh, should be the most important, the centerpiece of any reform. We have raised capital requirements significantly. They're, they're, I think banks are still have a lot of leverage, though. So um, I don't know. I think uh, the financial system at this point um, is much more stable than it used to be. But if there's an external shock, and there you get the political instability in, right? So if, if there's something that will spook the markets, I, I think you could have some, some issues again. So I, I don't really rest easy. I still keep a sharp okay, eye on so, financial, so, financial so regulations. So Jamie Diamond, uh, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, famously told his daughter during the financial crisis back, and she was probably 17 years old, she called up and said to him, Daddy, what is a financial crisis? And he <laughs> said something that happens every seven to 10 years. <laughs> That's well, true. if you think about where we are now, well, this recovery is long in the tooth. There's no, there's no doubt about that. And you know, the debt, the problems have shifted. So it's not mortgage debt anymore. Right. On the consumer side, it, it's, it's, it's auto, it's student debt. Uh, you're seeing credit cards right. creep up. Corporations have levered up a lot more with all these cheap interest rates. Governments have levered up a lot more with all these cheap interest rates. So I think if there's another crisis, probably the, the pockets of the, of the system that are gonna be vulnerable are very different from what we saw in 2008. Okay, thank yeah. you for that. We're gonna go to Adam, who I know has uh, yep. a number of questions from questions you. Questions from the audience, right here. Can we get a microphone, please? And please introduce yourself. Uh, Dave Goldenberg, University of Hartford. Uh, one of the things people don't talk about is the fact that families want their sons and daughters having the state of the art in technology and engineering and in business and in math and in computer science. And they don't want third gen them working on third generation. They want bleeding edge. <laughs> and bleeding edge is expensive. Yeah. And that drives up part of the cost of higher ed. But nobody wants to talk about that part of it. So, so I, I have memory than I do, but at least what I see with parents now is they're getting much more value focused. So it's not so much, and, and that's, you know, you can spill that out to the fancy dining halls and residence halls and, and all that kind of thing. And that, there's no doubt that that was partly driven by, uh, by uh, students and families. But I, I think this, the parents are getting a lot smarter now and they're, they're looking at the cost they're looking at the value, they're looking at the job placement rates, the graduation rates and the job placement rates. We're putting a big focus on career placement as well. And we pay for students to have internships and job shadows while they're there. We tell them to start building the resume as soon as they, they come. So um, I, I do think parents get a little smarter about that. But you're right, technology, I, I don't want, again, there are a lot of different factors uh, driving cost. Technology, as some people argue, can lower cost, uh, but others, as you have say, it could raise it. And certainly, a liberal arts college like mine, uh, you know, we're we don't have any big lecture halls or teaching assistants. We've got, you know, our average class size is 12. The faculty to student ratio is one to 12. Uh, everybody's taught virtually. Everybody's taught by a regular faculty member. Um, again, a lot of experiential learning, getting kids outside the classroom. 
It is not a cheap way to provide education. It's a great way to provide education, but it's not inexpensive. Okay. Others? We do have some that have been sent in, so I'll go to those. Um, how have your various constituencies been pleased with your focus on, uh, sorry, have they been pleased with your focus on affordability and the initiatives you've implemented? Uh, what reaction are you getting from alumni and yeah. donors? So, so I heard the earlier panel talking about governance colleges, and, and you, you have a lot of very different constituencies in colleges, and uh, it's, it's a very different, it's, it's, it's a govern, governance model I've never, so I think uh, somebody, I, I talked to another very successful president when I took this job, and he said, if you can make everybody minimally unhappy, you will have succeeded. <laughs> so I, I think, I hope I've done a little better than that, but I would say on affordability, I, I think actually there's been a lot of buy-in. Uh, certainly the, the families and students really, really appreciate it. The faculty do too, especially because part of my emphasis has been what budget we have was put into our academic program, get smarter about the, uh, the administrative side. So I think for the most part, uh, it's not, you know, you can never get consensus on anything, but I think for the most part, it, it's been well received. Okay, next question. Um, Sandy Baum says, a great deal of debt is held by non-completers who have low incomes. Will they be able to pay back, and are incentives aligned? Yeah. Well, that's a really good question. And if you look at the, the, the major pockets of distress, it is, it's with the borrowers of you know, borrowing $10,000 or so, but they typically are the low-income kids. And so a $10,000 loan for them might be you know, eighty dollars or $90,000 for us. So I, I, I think uh, that's a, and, and they don't finish the degree, and so they don't get the enhanced earnings potential, and they still have the debt. So. Again, don't want to sound like a broken record, but that's why we need income share. Because if they don't finish their degree, whatever job they have yet, their payment's going to be calibrated to uh, what they're actually earning. But I do think, you know, it's an investment. Government's investing. I, I do think taxpayers are investing. I do think if somebody's capable of paying back something, they should. But again, with income share, it automatically adjusts. Mm -hmm. I've got more questions, but any other hands? I want you to know I'm not a typical millennial, just always checking my phone. I'm checking it for a reason. Um, how are you bringing down tuition and fees at your school? So we're trying to get very smart about our budget. I froze tuition the truth year with, with, with good support from my board. Uh, and this year, we have instituted what we call fixed for four. So we are slightly increasing tuition by 2%, but then we're freezing it for all four years. So tuition in the fall? The students entering the fall will have the same tuition level for the full four years. And on the budget side, uh, we're just trying to, I don't, I don't lay off people, I don't believe in that, but when we have a vacancy, we review it. Do we need that job? Could that combine with another job? Can we use technology better? Uh, I, and I, you know, I, I put uh, the spending decisions, again, based on you know, what it costs in terms of a scholarship for a student, and is it, is it worth a student? If you want to spend every $20,000, is that worth a student? So. I think it slows people down, and you know, you, listen, you're always going to have to spend. I mean, they're, they're expenses, and you have building, you have plant. Uh, I like one thing we've done uh, as well is to really try to redirect philanthropy to scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I say invest in people, not buildings. You need buildings, but you know, if you, the, I think probably the most compelling use of a, of a philanthropic dollar is for scholarship, is for help a, help a young person uh, who cannot otherwise afford to get a good education. Okay, that's great. Back to you, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Makes the ask a lot easier. Yes, we, it does. We were talking <laughs> backstage about as a president of the university, you have to make the ask all the time. You have to make the ask all the time, yes. But when you're asking for students, it's, it's an easy thing to do. Sheila Bear, thank you for the thank conversation. You. Thank you. Thank you. Great. 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 Great.